Hi, this is Pastor Kevin Bradford in Bakersfield, California, coming to you today to give a, a devotional about a fallen world, and it is a fallen world. So I want to take you today to Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. And so one thing that we know in the world that we live in is we live in not a stable world, but a fragile world. And really, this should not catch us by surprise. This is what I want to speak to you about today. The fallen world and the people in the fallen world are a fallen people. And every civilization has asked these seminal questions. At some point, who am I? That relates to personhood. Where did I come from? That relates to origin. What am I supposed to be doing? That relates to uh, purpose and destiny. And then this question relates specifically to this particular focus uh, of this devotion, and that is, what is wrong? And so there are a lot of theories of explanation, and people have tried to come up with answers to all of these questions. These are similar questions that every civilization and people have asked. It's almost like it's encoded in our DNA, and, and these are questions that we struggle with. And so then it becomes a pursuit of what is the best answer. And that pursuit ends up being truth claims and from different sources and explanations that try to get at the answer of these questions. What truth claims are better than others? Everyone will have a truth claim, uh, but it not, might not be the best explanation. And so what is the best explanation? And that's where coming at you today, I believe that the best explanation that we can get for some of these questions is not from philosophy. Uh, one particular writer in the New Testament said, beware of philosophy and vain deceit. So it's not found in philosophy. There's a lot of other uh, religions that try to come up with answers to these questions. But I believe that the Bible is the best place to go for the answer to these questions and particularly the question of what is wrong with this world that I'm living in. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, and then here is the key to this passage of Scripture. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. So is it a truth or is it a lie? And so how do we get at these answers to these questions? Scripture is very, very clear. There's going to be truth claims and there's going to be things that are an illusion. They're not real and they are a lie. And so the Scripture helps us in validating what is going on around us, the world that is around us. And I want to tell you today, the world is a fallen place. And for the sake of a title of a devotion, I want to say this, the world is a fallen place, baby. And we shouldn't be surprised by it because the scripture is very, very clear in its narrative and in its truth claims. It is not an illusion. It's reality. It's a fallen place. When I say the world, I'm talking about the actual universe. I'm talking about the tangible essence of what the world is. 
And I'm also talking about the people and the culture that is in the world, which is a realm of unbelief. The world is a fallen place. We know from the very beginning, this was not so. God formed a world where there was no disconnect. There was unity and there was harmony. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And so he creates, he creates what is typically called a paradise. He creates a place where there is harmony, unity among all the kingdoms of that which he creates. The animal kingdom, humanity that is in the garden that he creates, this, this whole environment that he creates. And so this was his ideal this was his purpose, this was his intention. And yet, at the same time, in the midst of all of this, he has to place in that environment an opportunity for humanity to have free will. This is an explanation of why we live in a fallen world. And so he places in that garden the opportunity of humanity to make a decision and make a choice of whether or not they want to abide in this framework that he is intended. And there is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil that he tells them not to partake of. We know the story and the story is and the narrative goes that even though they have all of this connectivity and everything is in harmony, their temptation is to try to know and understand what they are not to participate in. Every decision that you make Every choice that you make has consequences. And this had consequences for Adam and Eve in the garden. They made a decision, a conscious decision. And in the process of that, there was ramifications and consequences that were represented in that decision. And so in Genesis chapter three and verse 14, after this occurs, God curses the serpent, the one that intrudes into this environment. And he may, makes a claim that upon his belly he will go and he will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So the evil intrusion or the temptation that enters into the garden is there. There is a curse upon that serpent. The woman is also directed in terms of what is transpiring because of that decision. I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception and sorrow thou shalt be, bring forth children and your desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. So in relationships, there's a fragmentation and a breaking down. This is not what God intended. And then of course to Adam, he said, uh, the ground is going to be cursed for your sake in sorrow you shall eat of it. Thorns, thistles, and the sweat of thy face, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. We live in a fragile world, ladies and gentlemen. Hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis, drought, famine, disease, floods, fires, not to mention, that's all natural evil, not to mention wars, murder, pillage, mayhem, and so, it begs the question of what in the world is wrong? God never gives up on his creation, but the ramifications of the choices that humanity makes causes us to be in a fallen world. Romans chapter eight and verse 22 says, we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Second Peter chapter three and verse number 12 says, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the element shall melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Don't live today in a sense of false security. Many people think I can control what is around me. You can't control what is around you because you live in a fallen world. It's in my grasp. I can manipulate it. You can't manipulate it. It is not within your grasp. 
We have done a terrible disservice to people if we have built on the notion that this world is a stable place. It is not a stable place. It is a place that is running down. And God is sovereign above all of those things. And ultimately, no matter what you do to try to save the world, it is a world that is fallen. And the only one that can save the world is a sovereign God who is above all, through all, and in all. So many people have turned to theodicy. Theodicy is the study of evil. To try to come up with an answer of what is wrong with the place in which I am in. What is wrong with the world? And they'll look at things like natural evil. Natural evil are all those things that I mentioned. they are hurricanes and things of this sort. Pestilence, disease, these kind of things. And then there's also a study that branches off in that theodicy of human intentionality or human evil. People do things that are evil themselves. Uh, and so people have tried to get at that question through the study of things like theodicy. We know from the scripture, from the very beginning, there was a choice that was made and the ramifications of that choice. For as by one man's disobedience, sin entered into the world. And so by that disobedience, death hath come upon all men. And that's, that's where we are today. We live in a fallen world. Don't live with a false sense of security. I want to tell you today and challenge you today, it may be interesting times as it has always been because there's always been upheaval in our world. Our hope is not in a fallen world. Our hope is in a God that is greater than the world. God never gives up. He still tries to redeem. He still tries to reach for his creation. If we live in a fallen world, then it begs the question that the people who live in the fallen world are also fallen. And this is true. A fallen world means that the people in it are fallen. A spiritual connection has been severed and it's garbled. It's not a clear connection anymore. It's like on a phone when you're talking and you don't have a clear signal. It's going in and out and what I can't hear you. I'm going to have to hang up. Call me back. I'm going through a bad spot. There's not a, there's not a good connection. We don't have a good connection. We don't have a good connection spiritually. So we're in a fallen world, a place that is very unstable, and we are a fallen people. And this is something that must be realized for, an under, for a person to understand, I need to be saved. I, I need to be out of the fallenness of humanity and the fallenness of the world. And I need to be translated into something that's greater than this world because if this world is all I'm putting my hope on, I'm going to be extremely disappointed. How does people who are fallen people in a fallen world get out of their fallenness? That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, I'm a little bit concerned that in many cases, churches are not pointing out this situation. It seems like people want to be a part of the world that they're in. They want to continue on the same way that they always continue, live the same lifestyle, do the same things, have the same language, have the same function but yet still be saved out of their fallenness. I don't get this in Scripture. What I get in Scripture is that there is a profound cataclysmic change in a person's life when they recognize I am a fallen individual and I need salvation because there is something definitely wrong with who I am as a person, what I'm supposed to be doing, the origin of how I got here, and what is wrong in the world in which I live. I need a greater purpose or destiny. And so when Jesus comes, God manifested himself in the flesh. The word became flesh and walks among us. He never, God never gives up on his creation. He never gives up on it, but he tries to redeem it from decision and choices that have been made that create its fallenness. And so when Jesus Christ comes, he comes preaching a kingdom of God, an inbreaking into the world as it is known. And he comes with a message of hope, of strength, and a message of salvation. And he reorients the people of God, and he also reaches out to the world at large. This caused many individuals to be astonished at his doctrine. So much so that one of the religious folks by the name of Nicodemus in John chapter three comes to Jesus at night 
trying to make sure that he is incognito. And he asked Jesus, we know that you're a teacher come from God because no man can do these miracles that you do, except God is with you. Jesus answered him in John chapter three and verses one through eight. And Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, verily is a statement of authority. It's a double emphatic. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, you can't get out of your fallenness unless you're born again. Nicodemus obviously went to the ironic portion of the statement and said, how can a man be born again? Can he enter into his mother's womb the second time? This is an impossibility, and that's the irony. But Jesus again repeats it, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. And so Jesus emphatically, in, in two occasions, doubles down, if you will, it's a catchphrase nowadays, that in order to get out of your fallenness, you have to be born again. And so there is a new birth experience that has to take place. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the good news. The good news is if this is the world that I'm living in, it has fallen, and I'm a fallen person in this fallen place, how am I saved? And how do I get out of this situation? Jesus said you have to be born again of water and of spirit. The good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse number one, Paul said, moreover brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which you are also saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Here it is. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. This is the good news, and this is how we get out of our fallenness. There is a gospel. And those elements of the gospel is Jesus Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. So how do we identify with his death, his burial, and his resurrection? And Jesus in his ministry was very, very clear about these elements. In Luke 24, verse 47, he said, And repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was a key geographical point, but what was preached and what was understood to be there was repentance and remission of sins. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19 and 20, he told the disciples, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The name of the Father is Jesus. Jesus said, I've come in my Father's name. The name of the Son is the Son, Jesus name of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. Jesus said, I'm going to send a comfort to, comforter to you, the spirit of truth, which is going to come in my name. And so they will be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So in Matthew 28, verse number 19, this is also uh, an inclusion of Luke 24 and verse 47 of those elements. Mark 16, 16 says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be damned. And so all these pieces of Jesus' teaching, talking to individuals about how to get out of a fallen world because he himself has come to do the redemptive work to save us from our situation. He tells them this at the end of his ministry and he sends them to Jerusalem to tarry for a promise on high. There's going to be power that comes. There's going to be a reorientation, a renewing. And so his entire life, his entire ministry, Calvary, and everything that is effective in his ministry comes down and coalesces to when they gather together in Jerusalem. And when they're in Jerusalem, the Holy Ghost falls. People begin to speak in tongues and they spill out of an upper room into the streets. This causes consternation and upheaval and question. People's curiosity is piqued and they come together and Peter preaches a message. And at the end of that message, when they heard that message, 
about the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. They were pricked in their heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Save yourselves from what? Save yourselves from this fallen world. It's an untoward generation. It's the world. It's the culture. It's the unbelief that is in the world. Save yourselves from from that. It's a fallen world with fallen people. But I don't want to be a doomsday crier here today. And I don't want to look around and say, I, I never expected this to happen. And, and, and I'm at, at a loss of words. I'm not at a loss of words today. I'm coming to you today with hope. And there is hope in this world. It's not in the kingdoms of this world. That's a distraction. But it is a hope in a kingdom of God. Romans chapter 14 and verse 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So I want to tell you today, I want to give you some hope. I want to say to you that there are good news. I want to say that there is cheer in the world when everybody else finds himself in a depressive, anxious state. I want to tell you that God is still concerned about your soul he never gives up on the redemption of the world, and he never gives up on the redemption of your fallenness. And so he reaches, reaches so much to the point where he himself comes. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He comes to redeem us from our fallenness, and he presents to us a gospel message that saves. It takes a walking away from an old lifestyle. That's what repentance is, a recognizing I am not in control of everything I thought I was in control. And it gets away from you so very, very easy. There may be pleasure in sin for a season, but it gets away from you so fast. When you're standing on the ground thinking this is not supposed to be moving and it's moving, it triggers something psychologically and spiritually in your life that says, wait a minute, there's something bigger going on here. There's something greater that's going on here. And I've spent a lot of my time in my life distracted by all of these things that are in the world. And so I'm coming to you today with a message of hope. Romans 14, 17 says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not in these distractions. It's not in these things that are in the world. But it's righteousness. And it's peace. And it's joy in the Holy Ghost. You need to repent of your sins. It's a great thing. It's a blessing to be able to unload some things that you've been carrying. You need to identify in a name that's above every name, in the name of Jesus Christ. You need to be baptized in that name because that is how the blood is applied to your life and his name is applied to your life and there is a remission of your sins. And you need to be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost because that is the reconnection from what was disconnected in the very beginning when Adam and Eve and humanity made a choice, a willing choice, you can be reconnected to God. Humanity is trying everything it can to control things. Even today, people are trying to control things with everything that they can. But that's like a pursuit of the people in Babel that tried to build a tower so that there would never ever be a flood again. It's futile. But a new birth experience is a hope and a message of hope and strength. And so how do you get out of a fallen world? And how do a fallen people in a fallen world, how are they saved? A new birth message and experience. God can fill you with his spirit and his anointing, can put his name upon your life, and can wash away your sins. This is a message of hope that people in our world need to be hearing today. It's not catching us by surprise. We're not worried. We're not walking away. We're not acquiescing to fear, doubt, and unbelief. But we're coming with a message of hope and a message of faith, a new birth experience, and you 